May I request uh, everybody to please stand for our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we who are gathered here, who are given the responsibility to shepherd your priests, and as we are given the opportunity this evening to listen to our shepherds, our bishops, our apostolic nuncio, we ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten us so that this informal conversation will always give us the spirit to continue our difficult task of caring for the priest. Bless us this uh, evening and uh, let our conversation be a uh, dialogue between us as brothers in the priesthood and uh, listening to our shepherds uh, in the church. This we pray for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. I was told by Monsignor Nonoy that this is an informal conversation with the nuncio. And I am your informal facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> and it should be shown this informal conversation the way you sit, no? <laughs> uh, Davao is known to be the Durian city. And His Excellency was able to to taste durian this evening, no? <laughs> Very good. Successfully. 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 <laughs> Can you smell it? <laughs> Bacolod is known to be a city of smiles. Do you know why? Because there are a, a vast of plantation of sugar cane. And everyone who eats sugar cane should smile. <laughs> our our apostolic nuncio came from the Citta di Milano, yes. the center of uh, fashion. But God called someone to live this simplicity of life. He served for eight years before coming to the Philippines as apostolic nuncio to Lebanon, Lebanon, yes. Lebanon. Uh, just four months, I think, four months, you've been to the Philippines, three, four months? Five months uh, and five, one day. Five months and one day, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Five months and one day, <laughs> very exact. <laughs> no. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, please welcome His Excellency, the Apostolic Nuncio to the Philippines, most Reverend Gabriele Giordano Caccia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay here, there. Yeah. Good evening. It's a great joy to be with you tonight, together with your uh, bishops. Uh, and uh, I thank you for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm a bit nervous to talk to so many of you, and uh, so be, be kind and gentle. <laughs> and, uh, well, first of all, I leave something uh, as a souvenir, as a token of our uh, meeting. Each one of you will receive at the end an image of uh, Pope Francis. So I will leave, that is enough for everyone. And, and also, I thought that it could be interesting to have a text. So you will receive also, each one of you, one of these. What is this? This is a talk that the Holy Father had, like we are doing now, on the 15th of February, at the beginning of Lent, with the clergy of Rome. So there was a conversation. 
And uh, we have uh, an English translation from Italian made by Zeni, and uh, the translation uh, you will judge if it's good or not. But <clears throat> there were three sets of uh, questions given to the Holy Father. One prepared by young priests. The second one, priest of the middle age. <laughs> and so in their 40s. And another question made by the priest of old age with 40 or, or more years of priestly life. So three different uh, sets of questions. And you will read that before leaving, maybe these coming days. There are very interesting uh, and very concrete uh, uh, questions, but especially answer from, from the Holy Father. So I won't say anything about that. You will have this uh, for a spiritual reading after the, the important uh, conferences uh, that you have here. And also, I remind you, maybe you were uh, busy, but uh, on Monday, the Holy Father published a new apostolic exhortation, Gaudete et exultate, be glad and rejoice, about holiness. So I invite you also to read that because uh, you will find on the internet uh, Vatican uh, www.vatican.va you have all the documents in different languages this is also important and uh, so just in case you are not happy with what I would say you can go to the text of the Holy Father <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and what to say well I didn't know I prepared some small uh, things but uh, I'm here especially also to listen fr from you for instance tonight at mass I was uh, very much surprised about these uh, uh, many celebration that uh, somebody is supposed to to, uh, to have here I, that was something I didn't uh, think about so I say a few things some of these things were also related to what I, I said to the bishops because I had the opportunity to be with them at the CBCP in, uh, in January. And also I took part at the uh, conference on the new uh, Ratio Fundamentalis. Some of you may, most probably were uh, present there. So I, I've written something. I do not know if you prefer I read or if you just uh, talk like this. Okay. I, I was asked to conduct a facilitated conversation, so I prepared only a couple of points which I wish to discuss, and I look forward to our dialogue with also your bishops, which will follow. Allow me first to share some themes in line with the celebration of the year of the clergy and consecrated person here in the Philippines. I'm really glad to arrive in the Philippines during this nine years spiritual journey that will culminate with the great jubilee in 2021. I truly appreciate the choice of dedicating each year to specific themes and particular sectors of the ecclesial community and I find it very significant that all will culminate with the year devoted to which one? What is the theme of the last year? Communion of communities. Missio ad gentes is written. I do not know if they've changed, but it's written Missio ad gentes. So we are in this process. But the, the, the last year, the last year, not the next, the last will be Missio ad gentes. And according to me, this is extremely important to be focused on the goal, Missio ad gentes, even if we deal with this year, the clergy and consecrated uh, persons. And in this context, 
I propose that we appreciate this year, but to put that in a bigger context, not just in the context of the Filipino church, which is having this journey, but in the context of the universal church. And what is this context of the universal church? I take as a milestone the document of Pope Francis, Evangelii Gaudio, because uh, this is the document of this pontificate that the Pope himself thought as the Magna Carta, big uh, inspirational uh, uh, document for all these years. And I quote from this uh, Evangelii uh, Gaudium. In this exhortation, I wish to encourage the Christian faithful to embark upon a new chapter of evangelization marred by this joy while pointing out new paths for the church's journey in years to come. Here, I have chosen to present some guidelines which can encourage and guide the whole church in a new phase of evangelization, one marked by enthusiasm and vitality. And there is a, a passage, it's a very rich document, especially for the priest to prepare the homily. There, there is a, a very large section about how to preach and what to do there. But I quote this spirit. He dreams, Pope Francis says, I dream of a missionary option, missio ad gentes. That is, I quote, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, time and schedules, language and structures can be suitable channel for the evangelization of today's world, rather than for her self-preservation. This is so something which uh, is very important for uh, the Holy Father. And uh, in this context, to orient all our life, not for self-preservation, but for the mission, and accommodate our needs to the major need of the church. I was also, I, I tell you something about a feeling that I had in my first trip in Lawag when I arrived. It was 400 years of the presence of, the, of Christianity with the uh, creation of San Mm, Nicolas da Tolentino church and mm, village and uh, mayor my city, I do not know so in that uh, visit there was a, a, a scholar who presented the uh, history and he stressed the link of the dominance of the colonial power in Spain and the arrival of Christianity. And I was thinking about that. While we have to recognize this connection, Christianity arrived through the Spaniards. Let us seek to avoid any cultural shortcut which tries to reject everything that is foreigner or that comes from outside in order to accomplish full liberation and identity, which is a process that took a big part or is taking a big part also in Latin America, for instance. In fact, we often think that Christianity came from Europe and it expanded in the past century through European supremacy. That is partially true, but is not the entire truth. I've been assigned 
as was told, in Lebanon, in the Middle East, for eight years. And I was surprised by the pride of these old Oriental churches who repeatedly stressed that Christianity started there with the incarnation of the Lord Jesus and the call of the first apostles. From there, the good news spread in all parts of the known world at that time. And it was through the witnessing and martyrdom of the early Christian, not by force, that people were attracted to Christianity, which expanded inside the Roman Empire, but also outside its border, borders. We believe that the message of God is for all cultures, languages, and races. It is not a patrimony of a single nation or continent. We believe that what we proclaim and offer is not something merely imposed by one culture to another but something proclaimed to everyone and to all in order to find joy and peace in our common search for meaning in our human life. In this sense, missionary work is not a kind of propaganda aimed at strengthening the influence and power of an institution Rather, it is the sharing of a gift received from God so that all may have life and have it to the full. Or as we heard tonight, God so loved the world that he gave the world, not just one part, that he gave his son for all of us. This is something we should be aware of especially in sharing our Christian identity in the context of old and respected cultures present in the Asian region. The freshness of this new, 500 years, new, Asian Christianity and churches like yours helps also to separate what in the West is authentic Christianity from a decadent and self-sufficient society which risks to lose what made it great. So when we talk about this missionary vision, it's not giving one culture or one customs through power and positions but to offer a gift which is for the full life of every culture, of every nation, of every people, which express that in different forms. When I was in Lebanon, we talk about uh, the, the, the Catholic. In Lebanon, there are seven different Catholic churches with different languages, different rites, different vestments, everything different. But we are all Catholics. There are the Maronite, there are the Melkite, the uh, Armenian, Syro-Catholic, Greek Catholic, Chaldean, Copt, and Latin, Roman Latin. And I come from Milano, which is Latin, but not Roman, is Ambrosian also. <laughs> <laughs> So, just, just to say that that could be one faith, a common faith, but expressed in, in different way. And this is what is called inculturation. Each culture expresses the same faith in a different way. And sometimes we have to realize that what, what makes the unity is not the structure, 
What makes the unity is the Holy Spirit, like at Pentecost. We are Romans, we are Greek, we are coming from all part of the world, and we hear the apostles speak in our own language. This is something which is work of the Holy Spirit. It's not uniformity, it's communion. And so, when we stress the missionary uh, mandate of the risen Christ, go and preach the gospel, we are in the position to offer something which will be also good for their different culture and people and languages, not to make everyone the same brand. We are Catholic and we are global, but not in the sense that globalization makes everyone the same thing. Like each one of us is a different person, unique, but we are in communion. And this is the beauty also of, of the church. So when we think and, and we say, for instance, the Filipinos have a big uh, mandate, especially in Asia, but not just in Asia, because uh, the diaspora of the Filipinos is everywhere. And they are reviving, uh, revitalizing all the communities in Europe, in America, in the, the Middle East. That there is a special task for the Filipinos, this Catholic country, the biggest in Asia, to evangelize, to evangelize. It means to bring the good news and to have this mentality. We are offering something very good that we have received the love of God that could be expressed in many different ways but this is very very important and when the Holy Father say what is the joy of the gospel Evangelii Gaudium if we want to summarize this exhortation we should say the joy of the gospel is a missionary one is to proclaim the reason Lord say go get out open and when we think about ourselves as disciples that uh, try to follow the mandate of the the word of of the Lord we have to be synchronized with the main goal, we, we should all be worried and preoccupied how we can better proclaim the gospel. And according to that, adjust. Not my first uh, things that what I need, I need this, I need that, I need that. There are so many things important. But uh, we have to always focus that in a bigger picture and so this is important also for uh, the formation of priest the ratio fundamentalis reminded us that formation is not just the time spent in seminary this is the shortest of our life and the most intense but the formation doesn't finish with the ordination this is one part of a long process that finishes when we make another step towards eternity but until then we are always becoming more and more disciples of Jesus and at the different ages with different problems with different sensitivities like in every family, you have young parents, young couple, then become mother and father, and then the children grow up, and then they become grandparents. They've never finished to learn how to act in different situations. And so even for the priest, at each period of time, each section of, if we want to say, of our life, should be always a call how I'm now 
call to become more similar to the Good Shepherd? How can I be really an image of his love, of his mercy? So you see that uh, it's a task that never ends. And ongoing formation means to be aware that uh, we didn't pass the habilitation exams and then so we can teach even a professor in, 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 in school if he just stay for the habilitation what he studied and doesn't keep going on reading and studying and make research is not a good professor, not a good teacher. And that's also for our life. There are so many other things, but I stop here because otherwise uh, I, I am too long. And uh, they, I was told also that there is space for questions. So maybe you are more interested uh, in asking some questions than what uh, I have to, to say. All right. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. His Excellency is now open to our questions. The bishops are also here. No? Uh, maybe not questions, some concerns. Or even sharing of experience. Yeah, sharing of experiences. We have microphones. There are plenty here. So just introduce your name and who, which diocese you came from. Buonasera, Excellenza. Good evening, Your Excellencies. I'm Father Darwin Rizuelo from the Diocese of Malolos. I do not mean to be selfish, but this is a personal question. Being the youngest delegate to this convention, I'd like to ask the Apostolic Nuncio, if he has any personal notes on ongoing formation for me, being ordained seven months ago, any words? Because, you know, I, I, I've been hearing many words of insight from my brother Peace, who have been advanced in wisdom and in age. And I'd like to ask His Excellency if he has any words for uh, me as a young priest. Thank you very much. Be good. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a question to, to, to the Holy Father. The young priests, they start asking, so many vocations are born well, but then cool down, they become accustomed, they are spent. How does one pass from falling in love with love in the priestly life? That is to say, how can we expect the whole humanity of a priest to be involved around this center, which is a new love for the Lord? How are the desires, the aspirations and the limitations also involved? How to live in freedom a priestly life, which is requested of us? To assume with love but in the concrete reality unravels in a thousand rubrics and duties sometimes we feel inside a great train that proceeds to do without us how to feel chosen by god and fulfill as men outside a career and alien by comparison in this our city or village we often feel we are an incisive can we be a significant humanity? That is to say, can we fulfill life choices that indicate an evangelical way and this and this and that? So many things. A young priest uh, asked, these were the question to the Holy Father. And the Holy Father uh, said, don't look at the circumstances. Don't focus on the circumstances. If there is that, how can he do this? And if there is that, because that's, it's never ended story. There will be always something that hinders you to, to be what you are supposed to be. But find out your way to be priest. To be priest is not a cliche. There are very common uh, 
goals because we are called to be like Jesus, the high priest. But each one of us has his own way. Find your style. This is very important, to find our own style to be priest so that people don't see something proclaimed and something lived. And sometimes there is no connection from a facade that say, oh, this and this and this, because you have learned, and then a life that say other things, if not opposite, but others. So how to make the bridge? I used to say to, to the seminarians when I meet them, you have to be in harmony with yourself. In harmony, how do you make harmony? Three things. Your heart. Feel well. Your mind. Think well. Your hand. Do well. So what you feel, what you think, what you do, they are in harmony. Otherwise, we think something, we feel another thing, and we do another also. And we are disconnected. We are not a person. The people say, well, well, what's that? There is no unity. There is no unity. So find your style, your harmony. And that there are, of course, there is something which cannot be taken out, the relation with the Lord, the prayer, your own way of prayer, not just the official prayers were very good, but your way to stay in front of God, that happened this, I've done that, why? What, why this reaction? As a, as a Bishop told in the homily, no? sometimes there are very small things. And also to have somebody, as you said in your question here, wiser, to help you. Because the Holy Father said there are two kinds of priests. I mean, you need, for sure, for the sin, you need a confessor. But the Lord forgive and go on. But this is not finished. This is just the forgiveness and love of God. What you need is why it happened. Where I'm going. What is the root of this attitude, of this sin? The sin is a kind of fruit, but there is a tree. Where are the roots of this tree? And in that, you need a wise priest that accompany you, to whom you can talk. And so this is the important, also at the personal level of ongoing formation, to have somebody, a priest, can go with confidence, can open. And this one help to see what sometimes we don't see ourselves. We need somebody who's telling us, well, where are you going? Why this? Maybe there is this and that. So, relation with God. But also to find somebody who will help you. A brother, a priest, that with experience. And sometimes, and sometimes, could be a very old priest, if you are very young. Because uh, as you see, grandchildren and grandparents, they go along better than the parents and children. Because they, 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 they understand, and there is an attitude which is different. And grandparents have gone through life. They know what counts and what is important. And they are always benevolent towards the, the grandchildren. So sometimes also, instead of thinking that elderly priests, they don't, well, now they stay in a place uh, because they cannot do nothing are very important. That could be really somebody who could help the priest in their activity, not because they are going to say mass or to confess only, which is important too, 
not just as taking your place, a function, but really evaluate and, uh, uh, and uh, taking advantage of their own experience. And for sure, we, you know, in your Presbyterium, such priests, this is very important. So just some ideas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency. <laughs> Any more? Yes, there's a hand there. Father. Buonasera, Sua Eccellenza. Uh, as we may recall, the, the seminary as an institution of priestly formation was, uh, I'm from the Diocese of San Pablo, uh, Father Jerry. Um, started, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, during the counter-reformation in which we needed to really assure that priests will be effective. No? Now, in light of this new development in which we see that um, the seminary training is just the initial formation. And then, as you said as well, the longest uh, formation is actually after ordination. It should continue. I just wonder if uh, in the future we will have an institution in a way uh, similar to the seminary, seminarium seedbed, no? in which um, the permanent uh, formation for priests will really be permanent in the sense that there will be like an institution in which uh, we have a set of people who are running it and uh, there will be like uh, very much uh, a program uh, and not just um, you know here and there we, we uh, at the moment there is that Galilee uh, that um, is trying to reach out uh, to as many priests as it can, no? But uh, it seems we would need some centers of permanent uh, formation that will be accessible to many priests. Uh, I would like to have your mind about it. Yes, uh, this is something in a, a new awareness that will bring some institutionalization. But <clears throat> the, the bishop also are thinking, and uh, there was this uh, meeting on uh, Ratio Fundamentalis, but for instance, without waiting until uh, something comes, you also can provide ideas. The f in my diocese, for instance, after, for the first five years, when you are a young priest, you don't spend all the week in the parish but you are called some days together, all the new priests for a certain period of, so that you can also uh, confront yourself with the similar experience of your people, have somebody who can accompany you. This is something. We, ongoing formation is not, the documents say very well, is not uh, updating the, the, the notions that you had uh, after, uh, like in the computer, you need uh, number two, number three, number four updating. It's not just knowing what's going, but is how in a different situation and different uh, period of life, we are realizing what we are called to be. And there are different uh, situation exactly. So for instance, thinking already to have some initiative for the priest of the first years. Then, every year there are a jubilarian, maybe silver jubilee, golden jubilee, and maybe in the diocese they do something together to, to, to thank them, to greet them. So, already there, why don't you put two days retreat sharing of experience in connection with this celebration. That, there are ideas and you who are a formator, you just start. It's not, you don't need to have uh, 
a program with every date and this and that. It's, it's a creative. If you, if you are uh, uh, really uh, involved with this task of be a formator, think of you not just I am assigned for this period. Think what could be nice for the people I follow for a certain period of time? What I see that is important for them? What can I imagine? Talk to your bishop, talk with the others. And so there will be some initiative that little by little will show also uh, an, a way to make something more available. In the past, in the past, in the past, there were not even the seminary. They started a certain point in the church and they are developing. And so this is ongoing formation is something which sound, sounds a little bit new and requires other means to respond to this uh, necessity. And, but you, you have not to just wait what somebody will do one day, but also to start proposing something to those who have to take decisions and starting from your experience. And there are many things possible without putting up very big, big structures. So it's always good to see what is possible now, what is best, but what is the step possible now? where I am with this priest, with this situation, with this uh, bishop, with this uh, confrere, and, and, and so on. So, but for sure, even uh, after the, the uh, ratio, the, the, the conference on the ratio fundamentalis, there are also bishops uh, concerned to, to start thinking more profoundly how can be developed, but in the meantime also, they need some good uh, experiences or some suggestions from those who work there. And if somebody is busy in the seminary life, why don't be also available after to be a priest available for those they have been in formation during the young years, be available and uh, thinking also not just when the bishop will appoint me to another place so I can finish this <laughs> unbearable job to stay there. <laughs> to love your, your uh, dedication for the formation and think how it could be also for other steps who are not yet officially uh, done. Thank you. Uh, Father Onet Mangahas from the Diocese of Kubanatuan. Your Excellency, I believe it my question. Uh, Your Excellency mentioned about uh, Misha Agentes, and one of the very powerful instruments is uh, media, of course. Here in our country, you might have noticed that some much smaller religious sects have their TV networks. Sadly, the biggest church, our church, still doesn't have uh, our own network, a network which can propel and catapult our missionary endeavors. And one of the reasons being mentioned is because we still don't have a central local Philippine church government, which can be empowered to make initiatives for financial reforms, and other important policies. Since each bishop's authority directly hangs on the Holy Father, and each bishop is autonomous, will there be a time when the CBCP will be empowered for a stronger and delegated government and it simply remain a conference? I have the president of the Episcopal Conference. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, he will answer another time uh, to your question. I just make a, a point. What's going on now in the world? A big problem with Facebook. But not because of Facebook. What is the problem with Facebook? Is that they can manipulate 
in a way or in another, the opinion of the people to lead them to vote for a candidate more than another. They do for commercial, but they don't care for the commercial. But when you come to politics, everyone cares. What does it mean? The television is no longer the number one media to influence people. Before, they paid a lot to have a spot in television or to have their own television. Nowadays, if you want to win an election, don't go to the television, go to these social media that work not generally, but they are focused on single client. This is what's going on in the world. Now, it's right, it's wrong, I don't, it's another. So what does it mean for us? The television as an influence, okay. But if you were to be effective, you have to work on one-to-one -one basis. And this is what actually the Catholic Church always does, <laughs> to work in a parish, to work with these people, with that. And so, also because it's true, that it's important to be present in the media and so on, and it's important. I, I realize that because but uh, uh, it's, not, it's not maybe also in the world today with the changings of technology so important as we think it is or it was 20 years ago. And at the presence, at the grassroots levels, with these new communication means, I suppose every parish has a website, or many have, any congregation, any diocese, there are so many which are not the central body, but they are effective at the level where people are. So in a sense, it's good to have a presence, but don't, we don't have to arrive late when the train is gone already. We are working on something which is already gone. So that's my uh, view according to the reality of today. But it's good to have a presence also in the media, but the media are uh, very expensive. And, uh, uh, and even the most successful media are not that uh, in the, the public one, but the private one, because in the private there is a, a, a spin which is a commercial, with advertising and this and that, and the other, you need a lot of money, but not immediate return. So there are many considerations about that that I leave at the Episcopal Conference. But just to, to understand also that it's good to have a presence in the media, but nowadays the most effective media are a different one. The one, how many, people watch television now? How many people read the newspaper in the Philippines? And how many have a, a, a phone? How many have this, uh, their own email and, and uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and then this, uh, I don't know what. So this is also changing. And what is going to happen in the politics means that those who are very interested to influence, they have abandoned mainstream uh, media, they have gone to another kind of media. So in that sense, we should ask the question, not why we, we don't have a, a television channel, but what is similar for us at this one-to-one uh, -one connection with the church, I think. Thank you. Time to go to sleep because tomorrow it's uh, it's also a, a long day, I suppose. Okay. Okay. Last question. I am, I am Father Nono Pili from the Prelate of Infanta. Uh, this is just a question, Your Excellency, but I just want to express 
my deep appreciation because uh, I attended the funeral of one of our priests who was killed in Nueva Ecija and you were there and your silent presence was an eloquent expression of solidarity. Uh, so thank you very much and I would like to express my appreciation for that. I, I remember, I remember because I was just arrived some weeks and uh, okay, it's not clear even now how it went. I mean, we know some particular, but the real questions are not, are not clear. But I said, first of all, it's a priest. And so as a bishop, as a representative of the Holy Father, and also coming for the Middle East, where so many Christians, normal Christians, not just priests and bishops, there are still two bishops kidnapped in Syria, and now are uh, five years, we don't know anything about them. And there are so many who were killed. So, as the Holy Father said, there are more martyrs in the present days than at the beginning of the history of the church. So that is very important to, to show, not to, to make a talk. As you said, I, I, I expressly want to be present and don't say anything because it was a funeral. We pray. That's our job also. But also to make those who want to understand that shouldn't be normal, something like that. No killings should be normal, but especially a killing of a priest. And also to show that uh, sometimes the priest feel a little bit alone where he is. Well, he's never alone. The church is with him. The Lord for sure is always with him. But it's good also sometimes to show solidarity. And that's also ongoing formation. Sometimes it's enough to make a phone call. Hey, how are you? I haven't seen you last meeting. There is a problem. Very simple things. Because uh, the priests are our family. The Presbyterium, we, we, we belong to each, each, each other. I mean, we don't have our own family. Yes, we have father, mother, brothers, sisters. But who is the family of a priest? It's the Presbyterium, it's diocese. And we have to create a feeling where we feel really brothers and we share the same mission. And I care for you, not just call when there is something special, uh, or you have to do this, or you haven't done that, uh, but just human, human. In, in this, uh, in this uh, ongoing formation, there are always these, uh, these uh, four uh, human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. This is something very human. Just to, how are you? I haven't seen you. What happened? Are you right? Can I do something for you? Very simple, very simple. That changed the life of a, of a priest. Invite to stay at lunch, at dinner, if he's there. So it's, it's important to feel that the Presbyterium is our family. And as in each family, also what can I do to make the family live better? This is not just some, some uh, club that I try to avoid because it, there is always the uh, same things and same problems and this and that. Make the difference. Try to, to change it. But uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank so many good priests that work in very difficult conditions and sometimes are, uh, they feel a little bit abandoned or not uh, remembered by the other. There are very, very good, good priests and we should always thank the Lord for their presence and encourage them to let them feel that uh, they are important. For instance, now, 
in, in the Nansachar, I found this very good tradition. Uh, we have a calendar of the CBCP, and in the calendar there is written, today is the birthday of this bishop, today is the Episcopal ordination of this and that. And the sister at the prayer of the faithful, every day, if there is somebody, today we pray for bishops and, and in his birthday or this and that. So, when I finished the Mass, I called the bishop, like, ah, we prayed for you, it's your birthday, happy birthday. Uh, maybe the bishop, the nuns is calling me, what's wrong? <laughs> 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 but it's just to say, <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> Nothing, it's finished, okay. But uh, to feel that uh, there is a concern, there is uh, your part of the family, we are together. So you can do that with uh, your uh, priests around you, with the simple things, but it's an attitude. It's an attitude. This is ongoing formation, not just make a congress and this and that. This is important, but there are very concrete steps. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, today we've been talking about uh, importance of communion in sacramental fraternity. And Coming here, coming here, in ex you're coming here in person, is really an experience of fraternity. Fraternity. And uh, we are grateful for tonight's informal conversation. I think you would agree that His Excellency has that gift of humor, <laughs> which inspired us. And the first time I met you at the Nunsature, <laughs> it was a terrifying encounter. I said to myself, I just kept it, but I, I tell this to you now, that this man is a very good communicator because he has a very powerful eye contact you know, when he speaks. It is as if you are placed in the palm of his hands. Not to be manipulated, but to let us feel, the listeners, that we are in safe hands. Listening to our questions and answering to our questions, you made us feel that we belong to a church that welcomes questions and pastoral concerns. Tonight, we end with a song to the Blessed Mother who first gave Jesus the first human experience of belongingness. Please rise. Salve Regina, Pater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Estes Nostra Salve, A Te for us, O Holy Mary, Mother of God. We ask His Excellency to give us the final blessing. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night. Thank you very much.
Oh yeah, it's it, it, it. Tutta la mattina fino a pranzo. Oh, yeah. Sige, sige, sige. Very well. One more, aha. Ah, sige, sige. I think one more starting. Hey, do something.